if you were tricked into joining a death game where you have to kill players for cash, what would you do? There's no way to escape this place, so I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the death game in the Insight Mail. This man is about to make the biggest mistake of his life. Yuki here is desperately looking for a part-time job, and he's about to give up when he turns around to see a beautiful girl behind him. She notices that he's looking for work, and suggests he check out this job offer she's been given. He reads the description on her phone, and is blown away to discover that it's paying $972 an hour. It's too much to turn down, and Yuki applies for the job. Later, he's picked up in a limousine along with the other applicants, and they're all excited to find out more, but they have no idea that it's going to be the worst experience of their lives. They arrive at a strange building far from the city, and all the passengers get out of the limos, but nobody comes out to welcome them. Something doesn't feel right, but with money on the line, they all head inside. Walking into the building, the group finds an empty lobby where a voice tells them to put all their belongings into the lockers. For the next seven days, they'll be locked inside a research facility where psychological data will be gathered and everything they do will be monitored. The test subjects will be put through immoral situations, and this is their last chance to turn back, but everyone agrees to participate and head deeper inside the building. The group steps inside a luxurious dining room, but as the last person enters, the door behind them locks shut. Looking around the room, the group sees a countdown showing how much time they have left, but there's a strange number counting below it. None of them understand what it's for, but seeing that a meal has been prepared, they all sit down to eat dinner. Osako here suggests they all get to know each other, and they go around the room making introductions, but that's when they suddenly hear a voice on the PA, and realize it's coming from this figurine. It welcomes them to the experiment, and introduces a robotic guard that will be their only other companion for the next seven days. A presentation suddenly starts playing, and explains the rules of this facility. First, everyone must stay in their rooms after 10pm, or else the guard will eliminate them from the game. The second rule is, if a crime happens, then they must solve it and find the culprit. The group will vote on who they think committed the crime, and if a majority agree, the criminal will be sentenced to prison, but there's one final rule. The game ends if seven days have passed, or when only two survivors remain, and from this point on, things are going to get violent. Okay, this guy really didn't learn his lesson from Kaiji, Death Note, or Battle Royale, and his biggest mistake was missing the telltale signs of a death game. First of all, if you're being offered $1,000 an hour, you have to assume that what you're being asked to do will be worth that much money in return. No one in this group has a skill set that deserves this kind of salary, so the logical conclusion is that they're probably going to make you do something that's pretty f***ed up. Secondly, this rules presentation gave them plenty of reason to think they're in danger because it used the word survivor. This is a clear indication that the losers won't make it out of here alive, and if we want to escape this place, we have to act on this information before everyone else. The first thing we should do is find every player's weakness like we're Sherlock Holmes so we can take advantage of them when the shit hits the fan. If you look here, you can see that all the players have a packed bag except for these two. This is extremely suspicious, because everyone knows that they're going to be here for 7 days. These two players are already acting like they have nothing to lose, and that makes them sussy like you wouldn't believe. Thankfully, they've both already given away more information than they realize. At the dinner table, this man's hand is shaking, and that's most likely a sign that he's an alcoholic. He introduced himself as the CEO of a company, and it's normal Japanese work culture to take their clients out for heavy drinking. This is great news for a death game strategy, because if there's any opportunity to poison his drink, he's going to find it hard to resist his addiction. This other man has less obvious characteristics, and that's exactly why he might be a wanted criminal. The man is intentionally dressed as inconspicuous as possible by hiding his face and wearing nondescript clothing with muted colors. This is known as Gray Man Tactics, and it's even used by espionage operatives to avoid any unwanted attention. If he's accustomed to moving in the shadows, he's going to be a very skilled opponent, and that's why I would make sure he's killed first. Now as a general strategy, there's a good way to test the rest of the group to figure out how well they're going to react to this death game. If it were me, I would choose not to eat the food on the first night. Anyone who notices that we haven't touched our meals and decides to copy us means they're very observant and wondering if it might be poisoned. This is a litmus test for who's thinking about their own survival and who is not. 
Yuki here tries to reassure everyone that nothing bad will happen since killing each other was never in the job description. But Nishino points out they're trapped here with no way to escape or call for help. It's a death trap, but Yuki has an idea. He suggests they should all promise not to hurt each other, and the old man agrees with him. It's the only way they'll survive, and if they don't establish trust, it's going to turn into a bloodbath. In the hallway, this girl asks her boyfriend why he lied earlier by introducing himself as a medical intern, but that's when he sees Maki walk by and pulls him aside, asking for his support whenever there's a vote. The kid tells him he'll think about it, but as he's walking away, Nishino here approaches them. He suggests that the old man in EY looked like wanted serial killers from the news, making the group more suspicious of the other players. Meanwhile, Ando here looks around and finds dried blood on the wall. It's a sign that they aren't the first people to join this experiment, and it doesn't look like things ended well for them. Preparing for curfew, Yuki here walks into his suite and closes the door, but discovers that there's no lock. It's unnerving, and the man continues looking around, finding this strange metal box inside. Putting his key card in the slot, a light turns on and he lifts up the lid, discovering a fire poker inside along with the card. He picks it up to read, and it instructs him to murder someone using the weapon, as the man realizes that this has officially turned into a death game. The next day, he wakes up to find Shoko standing right beside his bed. She asks if he's looked inside his box yet, and Yuki realizes her room has one as well. Suddenly, they hear screaming in the hallway and run outside to discover the first victim lying on the floor. It's Nishino, and as the last test subject arrives at the crime scene, he can't help but laugh. Yuki stares at him in shock, as the players realize nobody can be trusted. That's one down, and nine more to go. The old man finds a card along with a bullet casing on the floor, while Osako here examines the corpse. The victim was shot five times, but no one heard any gunfire, and the housewife thinks that the doors must be soundproof. Panicking, Yuki runs into the dining room screaming for the experiment to end, but it's no use. The doors won't open, and they have no choice but to keep playing. Okay, this just got serious. After only one night, someone's already been murdered, and it means these players are not messing around. Now, as scary as this is, it's actually the best thing that could have happened. After 144 hours of the game will end, and for every person that dies, we are one step closer to winning without having to get our hands dirty. We want to keep this pattern going for as long as possible, and that's why my strategy on the first two nights would be to do nothing. First of all, we know that wandering out in the hallways is extremely risky, because if we're caught by the guard, we could be eliminated, and that's not a risk I'm willing to take until I learn more. It's better to let others take these risks and learn from their mistakes instead. The biggest problem with this strategy is that this door doesn't lock, and we can't barricade ourselves inside because it's a sliding door. Anyone could come in and kill us in our sleep, so we need a way to add an extra layer of protection to prevent that from happening. The best solution here is to use our shoelaces and tie one end to the door handle. I would then tie the other end to a glass cup or a teapot and place it on an elevated surface across the room. If anyone tries to sneak in during the night, the sliding door will pull on the shoelace, causing the item to crash to the floor. The sound will wake us up with enough time to react to the threat, and it gives us a chance to defend ourselves without having to stay awake through the night. Now, it's going to take way too much time to run across the room and use the key card to get our weapon out of the box. So for this strategy to be effective, the smart thing to do is take our weapon to bed so that we're ready to defend ourselves if someone tries to kill us. The old man suggests they check the dead player's box, and when he reaches inside, he discovers the letter is still there. Nishino had been instructed to use a cyanide pill to poison someone, and on the bottom of the card, it says, Mystery of the Green Capsule. Shoko and the housewife are the only ones who know that it's a reference to a famous mystery writer. That's when someone starts screaming, and the others run into the hallway to find that the dead body has been moved. Turning the corner, they see the robot has carried it to this room before dropping him into a coffin, and there's one here for each of them. Osako points out that someone must have a gun in their box and suddenly accuses EY of being the murderer. The man explains that earlier, the victim suspected him of being a serial killer and must have shot him to protect his secret. Suggesting they take a vote, he asks who agrees with his theory, and the majority raise their hands. With that, the robot guard enters the room, heading straight for EY and picks the man up into the air. The other contestants follow as he's taken to another room and watch the player get electrocuted without mercy. That's two down and eight more to go. 
Going back to his room, Yuki finally has a chance to open his box. But when he lifts up the lid, the man discovers something terrifying. His fire poker has been replaced with a gun, and that means he's been framed for murder. Nervous, he walks back to the dining room trying to act casual when this figurine suddenly announces that Osako has been awarded $276,000 for solving the crime. Mia suggests they open the criminal's box to see what weapon he had, but when they look inside, they find it empty. They just accused the wrong man, and it means there's still a killer on the loose. Okay, this is getting interesting. First of all, they took a vote to decide if EY was the killer, but none of them tried to look for evidence to back up their claim. It would have made more sense to go into everyone's rooms as a group to check each weapon box one by one. This might reveal the true killer before they have a chance to cover up their tracks, and at the very least, it removes everyone's ability to lie about their weapons for the rest of the game. Now, whenever we solve a crime, we get more money, so there's definitely an incentive to use this strategy, but this is where things can seriously backfire. If everyone knows what your weapon is, then you won't be able to use it without getting caught, and that makes it much harder for us to kill our competition. This would give power to the most physically capable players in the game, so checking weapons at this stage would be a death sentence for most of the group. The good news is that whoever tried to frame Yuki is an idiot, because they just given him a major advantage. A gun is a huge upgrade from a fire poker because it's a ranged weapon and a lot easier to kill people with. If we can count on others to not check our weapon box, then being framed won't matter, and I'd make this trade any day of the week. Now, when it comes to solving the crime, there's actually a lot we can learn from Nishino's murder, and it starts with his bullet wounds. If you look at this reference here, you can see that exit wounds have a very different pattern from entrance wounds, and this information helps us deduce that he was clearly facing his attacker without running away. We also know from this card on the floor that he was player number 9, and that means he barely made it 2 meters from his own room before getting shot. Now, what's most interesting is that Nishino here wasn't trying to murder anyone at all, because when they opened his box, they found his weapon still inside. With all this in mind, it's possible that he was meeting someone in the hallway that he didn't consider dangerous, and that that person turned on him. This means whoever killed him must appear very unthreatening, but is secretly a murdering psychopath, and it's going to be the same person who planted the gun. As far as we know, the only person that's been inside of our room was Shoko here, and when she woke Yuki up, she specifically asked if he opened his box yet. That's a serious red flag, so if it were me, I would be looking for proof that she's the killer. The best case against her is to use the angle of the entrance and exit wounds and measure the bullet's trajectory. If it's straight, then the killer is short, but if the exit wounds are lower, then the killer must be tall. This one forensic observation could help us figure out if the attacker was male or female, because Nishino was roughly the same height as the women in the group and could support the theory that Shoko is the murderer. Later in the kitchen, Yuki approaches the girl and tells her someone hid the gun in his room. Surprisingly, she believes the man and apologizes for bringing him into this mess, but they're interrupted when another player walks in. He quickly leaves the kitchen and heads back to his room, but sees the housewife in the hallway trying to open Shoko's door. He runs up, demanding to know what she's doing, but the woman ignores him and heads inside. Pulling out a magnet, the housewife explains she's trying to find out if the gun's been hidden here and slides it underneath the box. She should be able to feel the weapon move if it's inside, but nothing happens. Curious, Yuki asks her why she thinks the girl might be the killer, and she reveals that everything about this place references mystery novels. Only a fan of the genre could create a death game like this, and that's why she thinks Shoko must be the killer. They never notice that someone has been eavesdropping on the whole conversation, and it's going to blow up in their faces. That night, Yuki inspects the gun and finds out every single bullet is still in the magazine. This isn't the murder weapon that killed Nishino, and it's evidence he's not the murderer. Meanwhile, the housewife heads for the rec room to find a book to read, but as she's walking through the halls, someone shoots her with a nail gun, and Mia steps out of the shadows behind her, making that three down and seven to go. The next day, the players find the housewife's body on the floor, and the old man goes into her room to look for the weapon, but reveals that it's gone. Everyone gathers inside the dining room, uncertain who to trust. But that's when Maki here walks in with a nail in his hand, and accuses Shoko of being the killer. He explains that he overheard the housewife earlier, and that she suspected the woman was the mastermind behind this entire death game. Yuki argues that the girl is innocent, but that's when Osako pulls out a weapon and holds it up to his face. He reveals that this knife was in his box, and demands the girl prove her innocence by showing them her weapon too. 
Yuki stands in front to defend her, and the old man intervenes, trying his best to stop them from fighting, but he's pushed away. Angry, Osako asks why someone of his age and status would be here, and the old man reveals that six months ago, his son applied for the same job posting, but was never seen again. He joined them to figure out what happened, and now it's clear that most of them are going to die just like his son. Okay, Yuki is an idiot. He's literally falling for this girl in a death game, and that means he's not even considering her as a potential threat. I guarantee, Light from Death Note here never would have put himself in this situation. This is a very dangerous dynamic, but Yuki had the perfect chance to get another player eliminated without drawing attention to himself. He's only known Shoko for four days, so if it were me, I'd let the group majority decide the woman's fate and lock her up. Now, time is running out, and we need to make sure we're one of the last survivors by the end of the week. The biggest advantage here is that we have a gun with a full magazine, but with six other players left, it's too soon to go on a killing spree. If you take into consideration everything involved in killing even one player, it's not as easy as it seems. Firstly, we need to avoid the guard, then we need to make sure everyone's in their rooms, and lastly, we will have to disguise which weapon we use to avoid suspicion in the morning. This is a long checklist of things that need to go right for us to literally get away with murder. This situation could have gone very differently for Mia here because she tried sneaking up on the housewife in high heels. One bad decision like this could destroy your chances of surviving, and it's not time to take risks unless we can win the game in a single night with as little danger as possible. Now this actually brings up a very important point for our strategy. Right now, everyone distrusts others more than they distrust Yuki, and that's a huge advantage that we can't afford to waste. If it were me, I would tell the boyfriend that he might be the next target, because his girlfriend is giving him an unfair voting advantage when they decide who to accuse for crimes. We know that he's made a pact with Maki as well, and that means there are threats that need to be broken up. I'd suggest that he can keep himself safe by bunking with his girlfriend the next night. This would be a test of the rules, because if he survives, then we know it's a tactic we can take advantage of for ourselves. But if he gets eliminated by the guard, then it's another player down without having to risk our lives. This is the perfect win-win scenario, and he's going to be more willing to try it out because he wants to protect his girlfriend. That night, Yuki lists down all the weapons they've discovered, but doesn't understand why the killer left the cyanide pills behind. That's when he realizes someone's in his room and stands to find Ando by the door. The old man wants his help to prevent any more deaths and suggests they start patrolling at night. He's figured out that it takes the robot 10 minutes to go around the hallway and they should be safe as long as they stay behind it. Agreeing to help, Yuki walks through the halls along with his friend and she thanks him for defending her earlier. They stop walking and the girl whispers into his ear, confessing she's been keeping an eye on him, but they have no idea that the guard has just turned back around and is heading straight for them. The players slowly walk forward, but they suddenly hear the robot beeping and run into the dining room to hide. Yuki checks if the coast is clear, but that's when this woman approaches. Pulling her inside to safety, she explains she's here to help them patrol and the man decides to join her on the next shift. The next day, Yuki runs down the halls looking for the others and finds them in the coffin room along with Osako's dead body. The old man explains that he was somehow killed by the ceiling, pointing out this blood stain above them. That's four down and six more to go. The man believes anyone who uses their weapon ends up getting killed, but Yuki yells that he's a liar. The guard didn't travel clockwise last night like he said and it nearly got them killed. Wakana here promises to avenge her boyfriend, but that's when the ceiling suddenly begins lowering. It startles the survivors, and the men run out of the room to see Maki here playing with the remote control. Thinking he must have killed Osako, they follow him into his room, but the student insists he's innocent and pulls out a massive crossbow. It's proof that the remote wasn't his weapon, and Yuki tries to disarm the player, but gets thrown off. Maki reloads his bow and aims it straight at him, but that's when the girlfriend Wakana runs into the room. Furious, she swings a battle axe straight into Maki's head, and the others watch in horror as she dies from her injuries, making that six down and four more to go. Later, the old man checks the dead guy's box for his card and finds instructions to shoot someone with the crossbow. That means Maki was telling the truth about finding the remote, and the murderer is still among them. The women go to the kitchen to make tea for the survivors, but while Shoko has her back turned, Mia here secretly pours something into the pitcher, and it's about to f*** up everyone's night. 
They all gather in the dining room to process, and Mia serves everyone tea before taking a seat. And that's when she reveals to the group that she has a son. It's the only thing that keeps her going, and Yuki chugs his drink as he realizes this girl's keeping secrets and needs to find out more. Okay, no one is thinking this through. Right now, there are only four players left, and we only need to eliminate two of them for this death game to end. This means there's a lot more incentive for people to kill each other, and the smaller the group, the less we should trust them. For this reason, only a complete moron would accept food or drinks being served by another player. It's incredibly risky, and we already know that Nishino's weapon was a cyanide pill, so it's entirely possible that someone else has a similar weapon, or might take Nishino's and use it against us. At this point, distrust becomes a legitimate survival skill, so if I were in Yuki's position, I would have immediately suspected that we were being played and refused the drink. Instead of sitting around drinking tea, the smartest thing to do at this point of the game is decide it's officially time to go postal. The rules never said that we can only attack people at night, and if we don't have to worry about being caught and eliminated by the guard, it makes things much easier. Earlier, there were too many players to attack during the day without it backfiring, but now that there's only four players left, this becomes the best strategy we have. If it were me, I would walk into the dining room and pick off two players before they even have time to get out of their seats. It sounds cold-blooded, and that's because it is, but choosing morals in a death game is a surefire way of getting yourself killed, and that's definitely going to be your biggest mistake. Now, the best part about this strategy is that we have the most overpowered weapon in the entire game, and it's fully loaded. The only other long-range weapon is a nail gun, which nobody is carrying at the moment, so the group wouldn't be able to retaliate and we would win. Yuki pays Mia a private visit inside her room and asks the woman about her son. She tells him that she joined this experiment because he needs a heart transplant and will only be able to pay for it if she wins. And that's when Yuki figures out that she must have killed the housewife. She has more to lose than anyone else, but he suddenly begins to feel woozy and collapses to the ground. The woman had drugged everyone's tea with a muscle relaxant, and there's nothing he can do to stop her as she takes out the nail gun from her box. She tries to kill him, but narrowly misses his head, giving Yuki an opportunity to push her over. He crawls out of the room as fast as he can and tries to run away, but he's too weak to escape. The man is going to die, but that's when the robot guard approaches them and warns the players to get back to their rooms. Taking his chance, Yuki pushes her away and finds cover in a nearby room before closing the door. The woman is stranded in the hallway where the robot shoots her to death, making that seven down and three more to go. The next morning, Yuki wakes up and walks outside to see that the others have found the woman's body. He tells them what happened and explains the guard must have also killed Nishino. Since the cyanide pill was dented, Yuki suggests the man bid it to get the bonus money that's awarded to dead players so his relatives could inherit it. They theorized that he was intentionally sent into the experiment so he would die first and spread rumors so that the players would get paranoid. It was the perfect way to get them to murder each other, and that's when they hear an announcement congratulating the man for finally solving the murder correctly. Yuki wants the killing to stop and suggests they destroy their weapons before waiting out the remaining days. The surviving players gather in the dining room where he gives up his gun, swearing to leave it here overnight. The old man decides to trust him and puts down his weapon on the table, but the girl is the only person who doesn't disarm herself. The next morning, Yuki wakes up still alive and heads for the dining room where he sees Ando inspecting the gun. They're all relieved everyone survived the night, and the old man tells them he has a theory. Noticing this counter going up in number, he suggests that it represents the amount of people watching them, and the foundation running the experiment uses the money they gain from their viewers to pay the participants. Yuki refuses to kill for their entertainment, and insists that they should agree to a truce, with no idea that someone is going to betray them all. Okay, Yuki is not learning his lesson. He's just agreed to a truce, but this might have been his biggest mistake. The problem is that this kid refuses to kill anyone, and the other players already know that he's way too trusty. The first night, he found Shoko in his room, but never questioned whether or not she might have tried to frame him. Then, he drank tea from one of the players and nearly got killed in the process. Now he's falling for the same trap by choosing to trust others, but this situation can still work to our benefit if we play our cards right. The most important detail these players are forgetting is that Nishino's cyanide pill could be used at any point in the game. If it were me, I would gladly surrender my gun and encourage everyone to give up their weapons for our mutual survival. Then, I would celebrate our truce by offering the old man a shot of whiskey and put the cyanide in his drink. Now, earlier I said that nobody would fall for this trick, because someone offering drinks in a death game is pretty suspicious activity, but this old man is the one exception. 
Ando here is an alcoholic, and that means he wants to drink more than anyone. There isn't an hour that passes where he doesn't think about it, and if he gives in to the temptation, that kind of decision making completely disregards all risk, including potentially being poisoned. His age is also an important factor because it's an essential part of old Japanese culture to never turn down a gift and always finish what you are given. This cultural practice is known as motainai, and a 60-year-old businessman would be more pressured from cultural expectations to drink alcohol if it's being offered to him. Since there are only three players left and we can't use our weapons, it's the best possible strategy to win the game. Nobody took advantage of this man's alcoholism or the cyanide pill, and it was a wasted opportunity. The next day, Yuki walks into the dining room, but something's wrong. No one is here, and all the weapons are missing from the table. He runs to the player's suites and discovers that the others aren't in their rooms. But as he's searching for his friends, the man sees the jail door is wide open. He goes inside to look around, realizing that EY has escaped. And when he runs back into the hallway, Yuki finds a trail of blood on the ground. Fearing the worst, he follows it until he arrives at the coffin room and walks inside to discover the old man lying on the floor dead. That's seven down and three to go. Suddenly, EY sneaks up from behind and starts choking Yuki. He reveals the jail door opened, letting him escape, and confesses that he murdered Osako for getting him imprisoned. He was given the remote control as a weapon and activated the ceiling inside the prison cell before dropping it into the hallway for Maki to pick up, framing him for murder. The killer throws Yuki to the ground and beats him up before stabbing the guy in the leg. It's painful, but Yuki manages to kick him off and heads for the dining room. He runs as far away as he can from the killer, but EY catches up and pushes him against the wall. The murderer is about to finish him off when Shoko points the gun to his head. The girl leads him away from her friend and demands he drop the weapon or else she'll shoot. The killer dares her to pull the trigger, but Yuki suddenly remembers the old man sabotaged the gun. Realizing it's been booby-trapped, he warns the girl not to shoot and runs over to stop her, but EY kicks him off, pushing Shoko to the floor. The murderer goes for the pistol and aims it at the survivors, but as soon as he pulls the trigger, the gun blows up in his hands. He's killed instantly, making that eight down with only two contestants left, and that means the experiment is over. The figurine announces that both the old man and Yuki have been awarded bonuses for their actions, but he has had enough. The widow knocks the figurine to the floor, upset that so many people had to die, and the door opens up, allowing the players to finally leave the facility. The two survivors walk back to the lobby, where a man is waiting with Yuki's prize money, and he takes his $1 million in cash. But as he's about to leave, he realizes the girl isn't coming with him. That's when Shoko reveals that she works for the people running the experiment, and her job is to draw in more viewers by making things interesting. She was responsible for freeing the murderer from jail and planted the gun in Yuki's box to frame him. He can't believe it, and the man confronts her outside, demanding to know why she helped him, but she never answers. Instead, the woman gets into a limo and drives away, leaving him alone with only the money to keep him company. Yuki begins walking back to the city, when he hears someone behind him and sees it's the old man. Ando here faked his death this whole time so he could escape the death game and the survivors head to town, wishing he had brought his death note. But what do you think? How would you beat Insight Mill? Let me know with a comment down below. Thank you so much for watching, leave a like and subscribe, and check out the How To Be playlist for more videos like this. Until next time, have a damn good day.